Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the UH Studio Architecture and Design Podcast. Uh, in this episode, we have joining us Stephen Kourlas, and please correct me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. And Stephen runs his own small company, um, which carries his name, Kourlas Architecture. And at the same time, he experiments quite a lot with AR and VR technology. In fact, he, on his YouTube channel, he's one of the leading people that not only show what the technology is capable of, because a lot of people do that on Instagram, but he's actually showing how he's doing it. So, Stephen, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity here. Yeah, it's very nice to connect with you. So I was wondering if you can kind of tell us a little bit about your story, you know, your education, how you ended up where you ending up at the moment, and how you decided to start experimenting so much with AI technologies and showing the rest of us what that's capable of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. We, we were talking a little bit before about our paths. And uh, so my path was, uh, you know, at, at a very young age, was always interested in drawing, architecture, uh, composition, building with things. And so went to school for architecture at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And for my graduate program, did a semester abroad at EAC, the Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia. And there I was exposed to a lot of tools like learned 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC milling, uh, and a lot of advanced design methods to apply or to use those technologies to build unique architectures. And, uh, you know, right after that, it was 2008, in the middle of the kind of financial bubble uh, collapse here in America, at least especially, and struggled to find a good design-oriented job. So landed at a company that focused on uh, manufacturing facilities for uh, aircrafts, vehicles, so for Boeing, Ford, and not a lot of fun architecture or design opportunities in that. Uh, but an interesting part about that that I forgot to mention to you too is uh, because they're focused on uh, really industrial applications for the architecture, at least on the insides of the mm -hmm. building, they did use a lot of high technology. So they were using laser scanning and, and kind of some of these technologies uh, to produce point clouds for some buildings that were either existing, uh, where they had to implement new manufacturing lines. So I was tossed into an environment um, where I learned Revit really quickly. I had to. It was like, you know, sink or swim uh, the first couple of weeks on the, on the job there, and uh, which was great. I mean, you know, Revit, in my mind, was the documentation and design tool. It became that for me uh, to propel a lot of the future design-oriented work that I did uh, with other companies. So after I had some experience there with design, uh, a lot of low, long, flat manufacturing buildings, um, I wanted to try the complete, complete opposite. So I went vertical and I worked at a high rise company, uh, one of the bigger ones here in the States. And uh, I was there for about a year because I didn't like it very much. It was a lot of edit, copy, edit, paste, same floor plan, you know, marching its way up the building. Um, you know, there's not a lot of companies that have the opportunities to do fluid vertical towers where the floor plan gets to change uh, every floor or every couple floors. So after a short stint there, I made my way to a much smaller company. And so this is where it's kind of the inverse of, of your experience, uh, where you started small and went big. I started big and, and came small, where I had even more opportunity to learn the ins and outs of a business, how it operates. Um, you know, I was fortunate to be with a really good mentor and in, in a position where I had, uh, you know, I was basically the design director and had some opportunities to do what my passion was, which was implement these technologies that I learned back at EAC in architecture with curvilinear architecture specifically. So that's where it sounds like you, you first saw one of my videos, which was the, uh, the greenhouse building um, and using some very basic programs, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second, 
to produce basically parametric architecture, curvilinear facades. Uh, so yeah, that, that project that I had done uh, a video on was is Greenhouse. It's a medical cannabis facility, and this was their flagship store here in Illinois in the U.S. Uh, in a town called Skokie. And, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity. I got to do a, a couple other curvilinear and high design projects with this company. Like I said, learn the ins and outs. But still, at some point, um, it's not enough, or at least it wasn't for me to, uh, you know, work under someone else's name and, and kind of uh, still need to fulfill the obligations of a typical job. So that's when I broke off uh, about a year and a half ago in the middle of the pandemic uh, to start my own company, Coreless Architecture. And, you know, the idea for that was to focus on uh, advancing the design and documentation field within architecture with some of these higher technologies like Revit, but also using digital fabrication to start to look at, you know, how you can produce more mass customized architecture at an affordable price. So that's where I'm at now. And uh, some of the AI explorations were just a passion that has kind of grown more fluidly over the past year after uh, watching some videos on, on uh, two AI bots talk to one another <laughs> and uh, with, you know, chat GPT being released and last summer uh, mid journey kind of gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, it's been a bit of an exploration, but just another tool basically for me to adapt in my kind of catalog of tools uh, to kind of pursue this mission. So that's basically where I'm at today. It's funny that you mentioned that uh, you use Revit as one of the advanced uh, design tools because in, in, in my experience, at least working in London, we had to rely on many other tools a lot because Revit wasn't giving us what we needed. So we had to script, we had to use a lot of writer, a lot of grasshopper to get the kinds of geometries that were required for the projects that we were working on. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. I, I think um like like we like we mentioned and and probably the funny thing is like, you know, the tools are the tools. Um also at a young age, like I was always interested in taking the most basic tool and utilizing it to do the most creative thing. So with like the greenhouse project, for instance, like it was funny, you mentioned, I don't know why anyone would put themselves through that type of torture to produce uh, parametric architecture with thousands of unique. Yeah. Foam so I, I just blocks. want to summarize that because it's, it's great, <laughs> you know, so uh, I got introduced with Steven's work because he posted a YouTube video on designing something that at first hand looks like a very typical um, rhino and grasshopper design process of some curvilinear architecture and panelizing it. And I think it's also, is it built or in the process of getting built, Steven? Yeah, it's built, it's constructed. It's already built. Yeah. So, Stephen did the whole conceptualization, but also optimization and rationalization in SketchUp, which is crazy. I would have never thought, first off, that anybody would put themselves through that, you know, try to design something that doesn't look like a box in SketchUp. And Stephen's done it really well. You've done it really well. And at the same point, there clearly are other people because I think you were using plugins in that video, right? So clearly there's a kind of a, a niche of architects that are using, you know, this very basic box, you know, platform and trying to add on to it, which I suppose is not too different than all the other architecture softwares out there because everybody's writing plugins and add-ons for all the softwares to expand their functionality. But yeah, yeah so that was sure. absolutely fantastic to, just to see that, you know, for, for people that would want to, it's clearly possible to design something, to rationalize it, maybe document it. Did you document it as well in, in so uh, that's, SketchUp? That's when, no, that's when we made the transition from SketchUp to Revit for the documentation process. Okay. And, and that's where it, it kind of became... Um, a, a little bit more parametric, but I, you know, not truly parametric in the sense of like Grasshopper or or kind of these plugins that allow you to really change the design. It was more parametric in the sense of documentation. So, uh, you know, I, I won't go too deep into like the process. Uh, there's a video that kind of explains it, but 
I, I do like it's really interesting that I, I love this topic of conversation and that you were so like you know surprised by the uh, the, the the program behind it. So I, I think you know, and your videos are uh, very focused on kind of ge the geometry also, and I think there's something special to be said with designers that truly understand geometry. You can use basically any program at that point then to achieve the design you're looking for. Um, and, and that's what was done, especially with the, the help of some plugins. Basically, a loft command was like the special plugin in this application. But it was really just drawing lines, spacing things properly. Um, everything started as, as a line, like a linear segment line, and then was curved. Uh, you know, using just a, a radius or an arc line connecting the, lo the straight lines and then lofted to get some of the kind of twisting uh, geometry that you'll sure, um, you know, we'll so post the link. a typical process in a non-typical program. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, yeah. you know, it is, it is, it's curious. It's funny that you, that you bring this up too, because uh, I remember very early on in my architectural career, and I'm sure there's a lot of young people listening to this too, that I think it's important for them to know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you remember too in school getting like design briefs, like here's your, you know, uh, the project agenda, here are the list of requirements of drawing types that you need, et cetera, et cetera. I yeah. disliked uh, AutoCAD very much. And I actually also had the opportunity at a very, very young age, uh, 15, 16, to work with uh, the, actually the, the last company that, I worked at before I started my company as an intern. Uh, they were a family friend and I worked there over a summer and I was working in AutoCAD and I thought, man, what a terrible program. It's just drafting like 2D lines uh, that represent things. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so basic and minimal and it doesn't communicate well. And then my freshman year of college, when I got this design brief in one of my studios and it had, you know, use AutoCAD to draw floor plans, wall sections, uh, uh, elevations, I said, no. <laughs> and, and, and SketchUp at the time was like relatively new and I modeled everything in SketchUp and it had section slice tools that I just turned to the camera to use for my section cuts, you know, use the colored elevations, uh, views for, for my elevations. And I turned the thing top view to do my floor plans and I got bashed in my reviews. These are not technical documents. You can't use a 3D model for this information. I go, why? It's the same information. It's all here. And actually it's like one-to-one -one with my 3D views. So I think there's like a, a path there in my interest of like using, um, I, I have this kind of saying, I say it, it goes, it's, it's no longer, especially nowadays about representation it's about presentation of the actual thing of the actual model and we're building these digital twins for things and so kind of to fast forward to this example of like my parametric facade design um you know we i i use the geometry in sketchup sketchup was just a tool to get the geometry into 3d and once i had it the way i wanted it i imported that into revit as basically uh, like a generic model that clipped onto the facade. This is an existing building, so it was a facade remodel. And where the parametrics came a little more into play was uh, slicing the model radially. Um, I forget what the exact dimension was, but uh, on the radial dimension, it was you know 16 inches. So I was basically you know rotating section slices on a radius like that. Um, to achieve a 16 inch foam block or a 32 inch foam block that could be cut on the wire foam cutter and mounted into place. And the idea with the 16 inches was that it falls on uh, uh, a rhythm with the stud framing behind it. So I also documented the stub, stud framing in Revit. And you know it, it became uh, actually a fairly simple process after the workflow was, was kind of decided upon. And if we needed to make tweaks to the SketchUp model, we could, and then re-import it. And then all the drawings for those section slices would be automatically updated because they're just cutting through a generic model that was loaded, loaded in. Whether that was loaded in through Rhino or Blender or SketchUp didn't make a difference at that point. Revit was just being used as the documentation tool for that. 
And after that point, you know, we had the drawings, we were able to communicate all those shapes to the fabricator. And we had, uh, it was under a thousand, I think it was just under a thousand. I think it was like 892 or something foam blocks <laughs> cut. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, uh, I don't know if you're, you'll put images on the screen or a link to it or something, but you can see it was a, it was an intense process. And, um, you know, also working with fabricators who have never done something like this before or, and, and aren't, aren't used to that. But I do want to talk more about with you probably just like the idea of using these typical tools to create unique architectures like that. Well, it's very nice that you mentioned something earlier on when you started talking about the fact that it's not the tool that matters, but it's you understanding and comprehending the geometry, the geometry behind what you're doing. And to illustrate that, I was working once on a tram station in Lucille in Qatar. And uh, at that point, you know, we we're working with some curvilinear geometries and my the the design leader of that project asked us to print full scale. Luckily, we know we had like a double height, triple height lobby, so we can print these really, really long rolls of paper with just a simple curvature at one-to-one -one scale to understand, you know, because on a computer, you know, it doesn't matter whether your radius is like four meters or 4.5 meters or three meters, you know, and it's about, you know, your height of, of, of you touching it. But when you print it out and you print a couple of different concepts, you realize that the implications of what you're doing on a tiny screen when it's printed full scale is quite different. So I think that's very important that no matter what software, there, there, there's something to be learned about how geometry works, right? Like pure geometry, almost mathematics, like, you know, lines, curves. And the trouble is actually with, with a tool like Rhino, it's very difficult to stick to proper radii. It's easy if you get into Grasshopper, but in Rhino, if you draw like a circle and you cut it into an arc, it's so easy to modify it, like to 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 kind of move the points around the control points yeah. that like sometimes you forget about it and you kind of edit it. I, of course, I talk as the person that never uses, <laughs> you know, pure arcs anymore, but it's still important to understand. I, I do think it's important uh, for for a number of reasons. You know, I, I think like this this conversation definitely like kind of starts to break the field into two different areas. Like one is like the the pure uh, geometry, like the the people who love pure geometry, and I'm one of these people. Um, and what I loved about SketchUp very early on was that I can actually like qualify the arc radiuses and the filleting and like kind of like smoothing out the curves if I needed to. Um, and then same thing with Revit, it could be very controlled in that manner where it's it's more like sculpted with precise geometries. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, uh, like I didn't mention. Wow, I, what? you use terms that I would never use with those programs. It's so interesting to hear. Oh my God, that's <laughs> awesome. I love it, that's great. <laughs> It's uh, hopefully expanding horizons and I don't know, um, as, as a, as a really young child, kid, adult, young adult, teen, whatever, I, I was very into skateboarding. And so kind of my obsession with curves started with building, you know, ramps and radius mm. ramps and understanding how to do the profiles, which is our, like the sides and then bending, curving the plywood. Um, so I, I have always been interested in like this pure geometry, but what you just mentioned also is making me think of where some thoughts I've been starting to have on like the future of architecture and the imprecise nature of it. And I, I've, I've mentioned this on a couple different like platforms now, but I've trying to coin this term, uh, raster architecture, because it's implying this sort of more fluid sculptural kind of application of architecture where you don't need to know all the precise dimensions of something necessarily, uh, even before or while you're documenting it. You have um, models that can go directly from Rhino or, or whatever program you're using to 3D printed. And I mean, as long as it's within the confines of a box that can be printed, like, you know, you don't really need to know every precise measurement. And yeah. I, I also remember during during my academic years, um, one of my professors telling us, 
you know, we didn't have these CAD tools. We did everything by hand. And if a thing was a little smudged this way or that way, it's a representation, right? And you can't get too overly focused on the precise dimensions of something, meaning like uh, when something's vectorized in CAD or any of these programs, you can keep zooming in more and more and more. And how far do you want to zoom in to make sure it's it's so precise? In the built environment, you have quarter inch tolerances, three eighths inch to tolerances. So, you know, you have to be realistic about how things are being constructed too, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I've told that many times over in using both AutoCAD and Rhino because Rhino started out basically as a plugin, a 3D plugin for AutoCAD. So even if you don't know Rhino and you know AutoCAD, you actually don't realize that you know Rhino because if you type loft, if you type line, if you type fillet, it, it does that for you. Uh, but it's true. The fact that you can zoom infinitely is a bit troublesome because at an earlier stage, at a conceptual design phase of the process, you actually don't want to be that precise because being that precise makes you slower. You have to think too much about tolerances. And that's why I talk a lot about using Blender for conceptual design because even in Rhino, the way that Rhino works with NURBS is that you have to start with like a precise line, then a second precise line, and then you loft between those two precise lines and so on. Whereas in Blender, it's digital sculpting, not in the sense like ZBrush, where you're literally, you know, sculpting, yeah. but it's so easy to push and pull vertices and move them around. I, I, I suppose a little bit like SketchUp, but much freer because in SketchUp, you can do that to place. But in Blender, you can like move every point and your surface, you know, is not completely discombobulated yeah. with things that are not that usable. So... Uh, I and that term that you said raster architecture is quite interesting because it's I, I talk a lot about it as as well, but in a slightly different way. Um, NURBS is like vector based art, and meshes are like raster based art. Yeah. In other words, you know there is a mathematical formula, and we're just seeing the visualization behind it when we're looking at Rhino, for example, and a curve in Rhino, and there is a tessellation that's happening on top of that, which is a mesh, but we're just seeing the representation of that. Whereas mesh-based software, which is SketchUp, which is Blender, which is 3ds Max and Maya, the the what you see is what you get. In other words, you know, a mesh has a vertex at the exact position and a face that's exactly that size, and you can easily transfer that information over from any software package to another. Yeah, this is this is a it's actually a really interesting topic. I think it can kind of like spawn a lot of different ideas. Um, the the interpolation factor, which I think like you're you're kind of getting at with like subdivided surfaces off of point nodes that that you're playing with, uh, I always found really fascinating. I mean, especially like in Maya when we used that program early back in in our academic days. Um, you know, you get to play with a, po a polygon or a polygonal like model and then, you know, click a button, whatever button it was, and, and see how it looks when all the surfaces are interpolated and smooth with a subdivided geometry. Three. What, what? Three, Three modes. Uh, in Blender, yeah. Um, no, in Maya. Oh, in Maya. Oh, okay. <laughs> you actually know. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I haven't used yeah. that program in, in years. So, uh, but but it's great because I think in a world where we are getting so precise, uh, great, you know, that has its applications. I, I don't always necessarily like to talk in absolutes. So I think when we start talking about point clouds and the precision of architecture being, you know, to on a point like that, uh, again, you have to pull yourself out. You have to zoom out and remember, like, you know, we are products of nature. You have built materials that are gonna have tolerances and, and should still have tolerances. I think when things get so manufactured down to the precision that just doesn't affect us, um, it's a waste of energy and it's a waste of time. So I, I like this idea of raster or, or kind of, you know, a more fluid architecture that can be a little imprecise uh, for the moments that, that don't matter as much, you know, curving a corner. And, and then why I mentioned like this breaks into a whole field of conversation is because I think, uh, and I've started to receive receive some comments uh, or criticism about 
kind of the artistic nature in letting the computer take control of some of those decisions, like the interpolated geometry and subdivision, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, how, how tight do you want it? Uh, the subdivided surfaces to interpolate the, the angles. And you can, I know you can control that. Um, but like, what's the artistic implication of that? Like a tighter radius is, you know, the energies are flowing more controlled, a looser is it's more fluid. Um, but what's the concept behind that? Why do you want it to be a tighter radius versus looser radius? Um, and then that we are missing a lot of, I think with like a lot of the, the, automated processes and, and a lot of these tools. But at some level, I would also argue that um, there's more important things to focus on than like the, the tightness of your radius. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and... Well, there, there are a couple of levels, right? So I did my postgraduate degree in London at DAA, Design Research Lab by Patrick Schumacher. Oh, nice. And in some ways it's like IAAC, um, it's very R and research driven. You know, we were basically exposed to many different tools, experimental, like Maya, like processing, like Grasshopper, and beyond. And uh, we were fascinated as students by all this new technology. We were so fascinated that we were letting, you know, if you're running a script to processing. And it's producing some kind of interesting amalgamation based on the inputs that we're producing that we, we, we decide to keep one. But at that point, we were deciding to keep it because we were, were, it was interesting. And I think this is what's happening right now with AI a lot, including, you know, myself, I started delving a little bit into AI as well. But that's very much like in the stepping ladder of understanding a tool, you have to go through that experimentation phase just to be fascinated by the new tool. And once maybe you have a little bit more control and understand how it works, then you can go back and apply the knowledge you already have to a, a challenge that you might have in, in, your, in your job or doing something. So in the end, you know, and there's a lot of criticism happening for AI right now. It's going to take jobs. It's going to do this. It's going to do that, which I think is total nonsense because it's like saying the computer took jobs away from manual typists, right? No, all those people learn how to type on a computer and that's what is going to happen. So it's in a way like evolutionary more so than revolutionary, right? Where it's not going to replace everybody. I mean, sure, some people have to either upskill themselves or figure out what how to do something else in case you know their their job is like so automated by chat gpt but for most people especially in architecture it's just another tool and yes there is that criticism that okay you spit out all those images they're fantastic so what but you have to start somewhere and if you don't start then you don't understand how the tool works and how you can use it for the development, the progress of architecture design. Yeah, really, really well said. Uh, I, I agree with everything. Um, yeah, the the it, it's interesting to hear your uh, your experience at the AA, with, and and I think the 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 process or the workflow or the kind of the design process of uh, selection. And I remember when when I was at EAC, we went and visited UN Studio's office. And they had like hundreds mm -hmm. of foam cut models lined up. And it's like, in a way, like you mentioned, AI is giving us those generations a lot quicker. It's not that the concept doesn't exist and uh, you can't be artful about your explorations, but you know, with the foam cutter, when everyone was starting to use that at big and UN studio, and I'm sure Zaha, um, you know, they just found out that it was a, a Hey, look at this tool that we can produce a lot of iterations really quickly. And, you know, I don't know if I want it a little taller or shorter in this direction or that direction, but I want to see it so I can uh, assess it. I think that's a fair, you know, I, I think that is qualitative and it's kind of, you know, we are in a very data driven world and we want to understand the, the qualities and, and quantities of things, even in our designs and be able to qualify it in our hands. So doing those exercises really quick to be able to assess it is 
more valuable to our society now than a very conceptual approach where it's here's my one dream vision and it has to be like this and I've never tested it in the real world but it's it's got to be that or nothing or you know and it's kind of this like yeah and art. we know that the design process doesn't work that way right no, any client no. no matter how sophisticated or you know if they, even if they're just designing you know an extension at in their house, yeah. they typically want to, they're thinking about a couple of different ways to solve it. And then we, as the professionals also propose a couple of different ways to address their couple of different ways. So we have this matrix of possibilities it, yes. that, yeah. that arise. And, and like, so we were talking about music too. We won't talk too much about it, but I just want to make the analogy. Uh, even, even an artist, a musician with a, a vision of a song uh, even that song evolves once you get into the recording studio or as you're practicing, developing the different parts of the song. So th there's, there's not any one vision that should, you know, be fulfilled. Usually the visions at their, um, adolescent stages are, are not very good. You know, after you've done these iterations and see what should be added, uh, after, you know, some user studies are kind of implemented in it. So, yeah, I think, you know, we are in a stage or at least at a point in society. And I like also that you're saying it's evolution, not necessarily revolution uh, or revolutionary. Uh, I like that a lot because I, I was thinking of it in more terms of like a revolutionary change. If this is revolutionary, what are the implications going to be on designers, architects, every field? Uh, AI is being adapted into every nook and cranny possible right now. And, uh, yeah, I have received criticism also for the AI tools, not necessarily being able to take a project from these concept images all the way to fruition yet. Yeah, of course not. But you I mean, can, this is like, right? What? But you also can, like, uh, if you and, want and you to. can. That's right. You and can that, use that's it for I'm... inspiration. You, you can definitely, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take long to build something up, but you no. mentioned something that I want to touch upon as well, which is the qualitative aspect, right? And I, I think that's really important because with architecture, you know, there's a new field that's popped up fairly recent, not so recent anymore, but in the last 20 years, which is architecture visualization, which started actually in London with Vionix, which uh, funny enough, they're Bulgarian guys working at Foster's that were influenced by matte painters from the movie industry. And the whole idea behind architecture visualization is the storytelling aspect, you know, that we want, you know, we have these professionals, these artists that are helping architects with their visions to help sell the story of who this building is for, you know, how are they meant to be occupied. So the potential clients or the potential audience can imagine themselves in, in that space, in that unbuilt space. And that's quite important in any process for designing at the moment. So AI, once it gets to a point where we can input something that's a bit more specific, it will allow us, it will allow architects to regain some of that control back, which is the storytelling aspect and describing the qualitative uh, conditions of a space that are hard for people that are not architects to imagine. So I think in that sense, it's actually very important and perhaps maybe a bit more revolutionary than I was initially saying. It will take a while, but even now with Adobe Firefly, it seems like it will be less wild than initially thought. Yeah, maybe you've seen some of these. Uh, I've at least started to see some people post on LinkedIn, like the the evolution of mid-journey from version one to where we're at now with version five. And I remember, and they'll use the same prompt and they'll produce, you know, the image, either if it's like a celebrity or, or whatever it is. And I remember when Mid Journey first came out being so impressed with the images. I mean, just the fact that it can take a text prompt and produce this image was mind blowing. But now you look at where it's at producing photorealistic images of celebrities, renderings, buildings, architecture, you name it. Um, and you look back to where it was in a matter of less than a year, uh, it's unbelievable how, how quickly it's become so accurate and so accurately able to interpret your text. Is there a, a certain level of 
uh, learning curve barely. I mean, yes, there is with everything, but because it's it uses natural language input in the form of English, um, you know, there, there's a style that you have to kind of speak to it. And I was quoted in some article about being an AI whisperer, which I think is a funny term. It's like, you know, being <laughs> able to communicate with the AI in a certain way. But even then, like that was eight, nine months ago. Now, uh, the the input programs I've noticed are taking things more literally. So even if you're not a whisperer, or, you know, needing to kind of input the prompt in a very selective way, uh, anybody now can produce better images for based on the input. But I did want to mention, I, I think, you know, what, what you were talking about with uh, connecting uh, basically concept images to built forms. Yes, like 100%. That's a lot of what I'm trying to focus on is, you know, despite the criticism being critical of these very early tools, especially like version one, where it was just blobby looking images that were impressive, but still, you know, you can't build anything from this. No, I, I agree. But now that you're getting, like you're saying, photorealistic visualizations that can help you understand really clearly what you're trying to, to build or design, there are tools that are in place. One of which I just produced a video for focuses on using what's called ControlNet. Have you heard of ControlNet? I actually started watching your video before the podcast. Okay. So, but it'll be good to mention for the audience. So, so ControlNet is, it's basically an extra process within like AI generated images or any AI like generative design process that can host either an image. I mean, right now it's image based, but you know, in the future, you can imagine this process being utilized with text or other data, but specifically for us, since we're architects and designers, it takes the image, it uses what's called a canny edge map or depth map. And there's also another, a, a bunch of other ways that it actually locks the image geometry, meaning the composition of the image, perspective of the image. Um, it creates outlines or it uses the depth map to map like what's closer, farther away. And then you can prompt on top of that. And what this allows is basically for you to have a reference image where the prompt and the generated image is one-to-one. -one. So you are producing iterations, fast, quick iterations, just like UN Studio and Zaha Hadid are doing on your design. And this is the tool that is gonna put a, you know, architects and designers back in control of using these tools to produce really fast designs and visualizations which is okay. And I think if people are scared that it's going to take their job, their visualization jobs, you know, it, it may replace some of that process, but with the speed increase, there's only going to be uh, it's a supply and demand thing, right? With, with this. And visualizers are going to start using it as well yeah. to become better storytellers. Exactly. And, and so it's a good thing. And, and because so many more people can do it, there's going to be more demand for it and more people are going to be able to do it. So, the jobs will infill, they'll backfill, um, but this is just like one tool and this is the very start of it. Um, where it's leading to next is full construction capabilities. And we were talking a little bit about that before, about this, this idea of raster architecture and why I think, you know, these images, the next process is taking these 2D images and making them 3D through processes like uh, displacement maps or depth maps that can be applied. Um, I saw a really interesting video of someone doing that to actually take the depth map of an image. And I think it was uh, an image of a desert or something like that with sand dunes, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was in Blender too. And he used the depth map to project coordinates into an actual mesh. So, you know, if it was a lighter tone, it would be higher up. If it was a darker tone, it would be deeper down. And so now you have a topography from an image that is actual digital geometry that you can 3D print as a wall panel or CNC mill, if you set the miller to you know, the depths, uh, to acknowledge kind of the tone depths or, or it's the actual digital geometry. So it would just be milling the geometry, but you have this process of going from AI generated image to digitally fabricated component in the real world. So if we're doing that now, 
you know, give it five years, where are we going to be? Like, we're, we're going to be able to 3D print buildings based off of these images. And that's where the conversation of preciseness comes into play. Uh, you know, with things like manufactured windows, sure, those are moments where you need to be more precise, right? But the curves around the corners, as long as you're not penetrating lot lines or anything for zoning ordinances, which is like, it's so funny to bring those things into this conversation, which is such a conceptual conversation to bring in those real world applications into using these technologies is, is where I want to think like you and I both exist, like in that kind of... Well, even the other thing that you mentioned is important. Like I was speaking to a friend of mine from Zaho and he's working on a project and it's actually going to be the podcast episode before this one where he developed a, a workflow, a script where if he can, if, if the planning municipality, this is in China, the project. So if the municipality comes back and says, actually, you know, for planning, you guys have to just shrink the curve down a little bit. At the moment, even with the most, more, the more sophisticated tools, that would mean, you know, if you're like in DD stage, like approaching CD stage, construction documentation, you would have to basically, you know, you, you re-rationalize, let's say your whole facade, you know, your whole floor plate ends, you know, your whole structure, you know, how many, how is your facade subdivided? What are the units, the, the unitization system for your curtain wall and so on. So what he's done is like, he's developed a system where it does, he, he he's embedded that kind of intelligence where even thinking about the fact that they are, the, there is the potential, you know, for the planning municipality to come back and say, you know, you guys have to adjust this based on so-and-so regulation, that you have the opportunity to embed that within your workflow design, you know, to make yeah, that, some, that, some changes. That is important. And I, I think something interesting to, to kind of, that, that, that just inspired a, a kind of a new idea for me, or, or like point of conversation at least, is this idea, or I, I don't want to communicate to everybody to make them think that like this idea of 3D printed rasterized images is um, avoiding detailing, intense detailing. I mean, with you. But that is also changing, though, in a way, isn't it? With new technologies. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. I mean, with full scale 3D printing. Yes. Right? Like they're 3D printer houses now. Yep. The design parameters are quite different. Than what they used to be. They, they are also with the offsite assembly of panels. Even you know, like there's probably very few buildings in the Western Hemisphere that get high-rise buildings that get produced that get, have their bathrooms manufactured and assembled on site. Right. So bathrooms, I don't know if you know this, but they're typically picked up, you know, the whole unit, including the partitions, the drywall and everything, and the plumbing, and dropped, and then just connected to everything else around. Yeah. So that's kind of, in a way, foreshadowing more of what's coming up, which is this off-site production, where the constraints and the precision is important, but in a different way. Um, yeah. It's not about having, you know, those really tight tolerances on a build, like on, on a design drawing. Now it's about tight tolerances, about where you're bolting your connections. Exactly. Or welding them. And, and so. even then there's there's a construction tolerance, which they have to factor in. Um, sure. Uh, and movement. And, and, and so movement. On. And yeah, I, I love that. That's a, uh, man, that's, this is a great conversation. I think modular construction is is yeah it's really fascinating to think like where you need to be precise within your building and then maybe the perimeters like you were just mentioning with with your colleague uh have the, the ability to be a little more flexible so there's definitely developer driven architectures and kind of you know money focused decisions that you that need to be made um that's important also for a lot of young academic types that are coming into the real world of architecture to understand those projects that don't have any of those constraints are... They all do, my friend. Yeah. They all do. I was going to say very far... <laughs> Just in, in a different way. I was going to say very far and few in between, but I've never worked on a project that did not have uh, uh, you know hundreds of constraints. 
Um, so it's it's really they're important. It's very important I mean, to, to to understand how to design to and and when they matter more. Like your example of the bathrooms. Um, but so I did want to say also that I, I I don't want people to think that you know with this idea of 3D printing that you are uh, avoiding the task of detailing. You know that that's that's always going to exist. And again, these things are are not happening tomorrow. It's five, ten years down. And there will also always be niche markets for constructing things still out of clay and adobe or wood studs or metal studs or you know, well you can 3d print actually and, and you can 3d print well out, of, out of mud and adobe I'm, I'm focusing on that the most because there's a more sustainable aspect to it uh and I, I want to encourage more people to embrace this idea of building with earth and mud uh from a sustainable perspective but what I was saying is I don't want people to think that I'm avoiding detailing. First of all, I've done my fair share of detailing as I'm sure you have too. <laughs> but I think what this does like 3d printing large components in architecture is a, it allows us to develop kind of a new breed of architecture where, and I've given this example in a lecture of mine, you can start to combine components like a structural member, a structural beam with a mullion head and that can be printed as one unit so that we're approaching this similar to car design where there's fewer synthesized pieces in architecture that are unibody pieces that are merged together where we can then decide where we want our joints to go sort of like a lego kit but we're taking two different types of legos and kind of merging them together now and then we have more of a decision in where we want to locate our joints for how these synthesized pieces click together. I am calling this synthetexture and it's like still in development, this kind of like concept in this design. But what it also does, that's like number one. Number two is it relinquishes us from the task of overly designing, you know, separate building systems to focus on new agendas like sustainability, like efficiency with materials, like mental health, physical health, and, and I think what a lot of this does, like the AI processes, any automated processes, um, I gave this example to one of my, someone commented and, and my response to them was, you know, you click and drag a storefront system right now in Revit and it automatically places those mullions. Um, you know, that was technically a moment where you could have had more design input. Maybe the mullion should be spaced you know, close, close, far, close, close, far in a rhythm like that. And you can still go back in and do that. But 90% of people don't because, again, this is a developer driven component that's being fabricated. And unless it's a very specific moment, like in the front of a building or, you know, at the entry that needs to be celebrated, you're not going to do it. And it's not to say that you're skipping a, a beautiful design moment. It's just that, look, we've created these technologies. We have the fabricated systems in place. Uh, whether that's good or bad, uh, it's creating a more efficient process and product to fit that process for us. So we've moved on to other things now, you know, more fluid forms or being more creative in other areas when, when we can or want to be. So I think what all of this technology does is just relinquish us from some of the more repetitive design tasks and allows us to focus on unique architectural problems. Um, I would disagree there for, for a little bit, actually, because it's important to know how buildings are come together. And the only way to understand that is, you know, through having some experience in uh, detailing, like working in a smaller practice or being on site, right? To understand how even like small things like houses come together. And I say that also from the experience of somebody who has worked in, you know, fairly large companies in London. And London is uh, one of the architecture design capitals in the world. And what that means also is that a huge chunk of the architecture professionals in London are working in the concept design stages of projects throughout the world which then typically get picked up by another architect or by a local architect or both. And so there, there actually isn't a lot of understanding and input, let's say of like facade systems and unitization and how they come together and, and the connection pieces. 
whenever there is, just because the buildings tend to be a little bit more complex, there's always a consultant on board who advises us, you know, for the facade, for the structure and how those things should come together in the most optimal manner using ideally uh, spec, you know, products that already exist on the market as opposed to trying to invent something else. Unless, of course, you know, you there, there are also those people, those clients that do wish to have everything custom made and that's fantastic. Yeah, and that, that's few and far between. No, I, I yeah. agree with you 100%. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I, I want to be clear that these conversations are very forward thinking. They're, they don't exist right now. Or if they do, they're in very academic environments with buildings that are experimental or conceptual. Um, and they're fun to think about. But yes, I, I do agree with you. I, I also have the experience of large and small firms and detailing. And, and, and I think that's critical, especially for any young viewers that are watching this, that look, the things we're talking about here are very high level con concept, very forward thinking, uh, you know, ideas, but the field condition as it exists today are very embedded in the methods, techniques, construction processes that, that exist right now. I mean, so much of architecture and and actually, that's a very important point because it is what's holding architecture back in many ways, yeah. isn't it? That we have to deal with construction. Yeah, yes. And construction, unless you're in a big market like Chicago, New York, LA, maybe London or the Middle East or, or, or China as well, you know, in most other places, even within those places, you know, you have a lot of buildings that are probably built in the same way they were built 100 years ago, minus, you know, a few skyscrapers here and there. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I think that's why I like to say that I don't want to talk in absolutes. I'm not so, you know, head in the clouds to say that, like, this is the way architecture needs to be moving forward. And, and it, you know, we have to abandon everything. Obviously not. Well, it has to evolve. <laughs> it, it, at the same time, it has to evolve, you know, and there are a lot of evolutions. And it does start from academia also as it, well, doesn't it? it or from those more innovative studios who are even, you know, I know some people that jumped off and this made like their own like 3D printing companies or they're making even their own 3D robots or manufacturing like uh, houses and housing and like factories and things like, like that. Because I, I look at the end of the day, we're 8 billion now, I think, right? Yep. And we're, we're exponentially growing and there's a massive shortage of housing everywhere and prices are like shooting through the roof everywhere. And that's because... You know, nobody's building fast enough because we're still using data technologies. It's even interesting to put this into the perspective. I mean, Buckminster Fuller proposed, you know, using technologies over 100 years ago that we're still yet to, you know, build as efficiently as was proposed that long ago. So there's still a lot of innovation that has to happen, but it has to also happen outside of architecture. You know, architecture maybe can push the AEC industry only so much, and it requires also, you know, developers, investors, municipalities to get on board, which is a little bit of what we are seeing now with higher rise timber construction, right? Yeah. You know, timber was shunned at for a long time, and now it's coming back because, you know, with, with OSM and with like engineered timber products, they've tested the fire rating and it's it's as fireproof as melting steel, you know, so yeah. even better. So there is an evolution and, and, it, it, and it definitely has to pick up pace. You know, houses yeah. or, in, or even like small buildings, they need to get built faster. There's no way around it, more accurately and cheaper. And the only way to do that is with architectural innovation. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, uh, like you mentioned, I mean, there, there's... There's growing need for for housing. There's buildings that need to be built, you know, more economically, and all this conversation is is uh, you know hopefully an encouragement for younger architects or people you know that are young professionals or kind of in in the sweet point of their career where they can have a significant effect on on the profession and our discipline is to encourage them to to pursue or to focus on these things. I've built a community around myself now, including you, 
Um, but especially on LinkedIn, where like I'm surrounded by people that are 3D printing buildings. And I mm. am, you know, set on my future containing 3D printed buildings in my local town where I operate my practice. I've talked to the municipality about uh, incorporating 3D printing into our, our zoning and our building codes so that once I have that project, I'll be able to say I was part of the commission that discussed, you know, that these are code compliant and I'm not going to get caught in that process. These are like behind yeah. the scenes types of things that nobody's talking about with the technologies that are being built that have to happen in order to push these technologies forward. But I think a lot of people and where I want to encourage it and discourage people actually from getting content with the Lego kits that we have, meaning like the storefront systems, the metal panels, the et cetera, et cetera. These are like, you know, you've probably seen these advertisements in some architecture magazines where it has like a car that's, uh, you know, exploded with all the parts like laid out on all the ground. And it's like, this is how, you know, people are, are building their, their buildings now is like with all these parts and components that you're just putting into uh, a vehicle. Uh, we basically have become product specifiers with a lot of the commercial developer driven architecture, at least. And that's just one subgenre of architecture that exists. And I think, you know, as you move into custom residential homes, that's like a totally different subgenre as I've started to experience, you know, my practice does commercial, we do residential. And then the third division is this like experimental stuff where I'm trying to push the industry. But I, I do think it's important to never put all your eggs in one basket because you don't know, you know, chat GPT can go offline tomorrow, as we've seen, like some countries are discussing, you know, halting the progress of it or not including it. Yeah. Ridiculous stuff. Yeah, I mean, Italy, come on. <laughs> it, it is a little silly. Like, I, I, again, I don't like to talk in absolutes. I don't think AI is necessarily uh, a threat to humanity at this point. I do think we need to, you know, cautiously think about how we're integrating it into our workflows and our everyday life. But we need to do that. And we also can't get too complacent with the systems that we have in place to say, like, this is it. This is the best we can do. Architecture is produced like this with steel frame, like you just mentioned wait a second, we've got timber and timber works just as good as, as steel for, you know, a certain height. And should we even be building any higher than the tallest <laughs> building that could be pr produced out of timber? I don't think so, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, it's just important to like observe the field condition. And I think like you mentioned, always push to evolve, maybe even revolutionize, um, and, and the more people that we can encourage to look into these future areas, the better, because we are going to be the ones that shape how these AI tools and 3D printing and digital fabrication are incorporated into our industry responsibly and economically and efficiently. So it, it's a good conversation. It's yeah, definitely important. But I think so young professionals and recent grads or people that are still in university, I believe that, you know, at least the way I was trained and probably the way you were trained. And so in the U.S., we have two two kinds of design uh, schools, architecture schools, right? One are more design driven. The other ones are more like technological schools. It sounds like you went to a design driven school as well, yeah. where uh, I mean, we're encouraged to experiment, you know, it's actually, even when I was at the AA, I realized I was at a point with my not so famous undergraduate school, which had the right kind of people, professors, you know, that encouraged us to to really think along those lines. So I, I think it very much exists. Uh, what does happen though is, you know, once people go into practice, they forget about some of these things, they get in the grunt of the work that they're doing and maybe you know they switch firms a few times but it, in the end it's actually fairly similar because you know all those firms are more or less at the same level on the innovation scale and that's where a, maybe a little bit more risk is needed from the architecture profession from architects you know to to do try to maybe do your own practice and try to experiment with different technologies or, you know, some people are even jumping off architecture and going into manufacturing or, or even development in 
looking into innovative ways to see how we can solve some of the challenges that we have at the moment. And clearly, you know, after the pandemic, what we're seeing is that there's a tremendous shortage of housing in, in most places. Yeah, uh, really interesting point that, that you bring in, um, like the differences of, of schools and academia. I think, um, yeah, like halfway through my academic career, I realized that there was a significant difference in attending a more technical school versus a conceptual school. And I, I almost regretted it a little bit because uh, I, I saw the way the world was operating from a much more technical perspective. And, you know, I guess some professors would say, like, you'll learn that, you know, in the field or once you're in the discipline, you learn that. So now is the time to explore your creativity and push the boundaries. And now I respect it. I appreciate that time that I had to explore, expand my horizons, learn, you know, how to learn and how to seek out technologies like artificial intelligence that can be incorporated into our practice. Um, but it, it's also a balance. I think, you know, I had the fortune of building ramps when I was younger. So I actually built a lot with my hands and mixing mm -hmm. that with some of my kind of conceptual approach to things. Uh, I was able to, or, or not able to, but I had a, a desire to always take those concepts and build them. I never wanted things to like remain on paper space. And, and I, I do encourage, I think that's important, even for these academic like kind of schools uh, or, or environments to encourage the, the fabrication or the, the construction of something like that is the end goal. You know, it's important for stories to be told and in cinematography and even architecture. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're beautiful, flowing, organic, sinuous three, you know, house can't be made, <laughs> then what's, you know, Unless, unless it's for research purposes. And oh, I think everybody's building models. I, I'm pretty sure everybody's building models at like the good schools in the world. Yeah, like it's it's uh, gotten a lot better, and we we were encouraged to build models. So so that's you're right. I mean, I yeah, can we say... built we built all kinds everywhere. Like in my undergraduate, you know, we built like full scale pavilions. In at the AA, we built. I mean, it was very important to actually yeah. test yeah. digitally some strategies and some methodolo methodologies and then test them physically as well. And it was almost like a feedback loop between the digital and the physical. So the material properties are clearly, uh, they, they behave differently than we anticipated initially by the digital simulation of it. And then we embedded that intelligence back into the digital model after testing the physical that, that's awesome. I mean, so EAC does that. I mean, they're a very physical oriented school. And that's where I experienced more of that because it was an advanced design and fabrication school where it mm -hmm. was like, okay, you're taking this curvilinear design and you're slicing it. You're going to understand how this design is actually going to be put together if you wanted to build it. Um, at the time, and I don't know exactly how it is now, but the University of Illinois at Chicago was so conceptual, they, there was not a big push. I mean, in studios, we would build models, but a lot of the courses were, you know, there were Maya courses, which were just focused on producing parametric creatures. That's fantastic that you guys had Maya way back in the day. Wow. I didn't know what Maya was until I came to London. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we experimented with that. Our professor for that was Paul Preisner. And at the time he was doing very curvilinear parametric architectures. Uh, you know, we were fascinated with the technology. It was basically um, fluid dynamics, animation, uh, you know, basically anything that could be animated and then paused in terms of a fluid process uh, would produce something very impressive. And then if you could take that fluid architecture and sort of slice it up somehow, that would be the end goal. But it stayed very conceptual. And then, you know, there was um, the, the head at the time was very into this conversation about like cartoons basically and how like cartoons should feed architecture because they're so um, distant from anything real world. So it got very... Uh, a friend of Bjark Ingels, maybe. Yeah, I mean, certainly at the time, the diagrams of Bjark Ingels was uh, 
was an influence on it, but uh, there was a, was one professor that I actually really appreciated. His name was uh, Kimenez Lai, and now he operates a company called Bureau Spectacular out of California. And I mean, he was also very focused on the comic book, actually, as a method to tell like architectural tales. Uh, but he actually had a knack for like building things too. So he would kind of take these cartoonish uh, or or animated um, or not. I mean, the comic books was his like kind of main focus in terms of storytelling. Mm-hmm. But he would take some of the structures and buildings that he would talk about in these comic books, and he would actually build them. So you know that it's. I think what I, I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm glad that you kind of clarified, is that if you are in academia and you know, there are or aren't models being built that it's important to focus on it. So find a way to do it. And or if there is model building and you don't really like doing it because you just like the the paper architecture, do the models because those are going to force you to understand how this thing is going to be built, if it is going to be built. And that should be, you know, part of the end goal as part of your research. No, I think um, for serious academic, rigorous academic projects and professional projects, models have always been important. And I've been lucky enough to work in companies that understand that and clients that also demand it, that we have been, you know, having to build models uh, consistently throughout, even if it's a simple 3D print, you know, of a tower or 50 of them to demonstrate and understand the different qualities of each massing. Yeah, that, that's good. It's good to hear. Uh, and I think it's a good point to, to clarify for, for the young academic types that even so, these conversations about yeah, 3D printing is, is... I was just thinking, is there like, so the AI research that you're doing, is it impacting your, your, the professional side of things? just yet or do you think it will be soon in one way or another yeah good question so i just onboarded a new client and we're building out a medical facility for them it's just interiors but i wanted to use that actually as an opportunity to explore how to implement some of these ai tools to show some people uh you know the the shortcomings of AI tools right now or where they can be helpful right now. And so yes and no, I mean, like it, it hasn't been very prominent in my practice as of yet. Um, I'm trying to find ways to implement it, but I'm also not trying to find ways to force it in right now. I think with, uh, you know, it's given me an opportunity to explore tools like the control net where like it's actually a more useful use of, of the tool. Um, so I'm, I'm finding ways where it's going to sort of land as a real world practice tool. And then I have some more conceptual projects. Uh, you know, like I have a, a 3d printed pavilion project that I'm in the works with my municipality with, nice. uh, the, the same township that, you know, I'm talking about how to embed the 3d printing guidelines into their code for building code. Uh, you know, I'd like for my 3D printed pavilion project to be the first in our town to be printed, uh, which was also, you know, sort of guided by AI from a conceptual stage. But as these tools are coming out, I'm finding more ways to use them like in the process. I could have already fast forwarded and I and I have like through a, a 3D printed pavilion design that was basically in SketchUp um, using lofted geometry but now I'm sort of reversing it back to say, you know, let's use this again as an opportunity, not just to showcase 3D printing and digital fabrication, but also AI architecture uh, that can be part of the story of this structure, which is essentially like the main concept for this, this pavilion is to offer um, an, a built example of emerging technologies for our community and surrounding communities to see where architecture is because this is built but also is going to be in terms of you know other buildings you might start to see in your area being 3d printed or having ai become part of other architects processes in the area so yeah the answer to that is a little convoluted but i'm trying i think because i'm I'm taking on sort of a position of like this ai tool is here 
let's see if it can help. Let's see how it can help. Let's use it responsibly. Uh, so I want to, you know, showcase that in, in some ways. Great. Well, really nice to talk to you, Stephen. And looking forward to see more of your AI experiments because it seems like you do them the day of a new tool being released or even, you know, <laughs> a couple of hours before it's publicly available. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's great to see. And thank you for, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to doing this again sometime. It was a great conversation. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.